Hello, I'm Kyle Warmack with the West Virginia Humanities Council. Welcome to History Alive. History Alive is a program of the Humanities Council that brings historical figures to life through first-person portrayals by presenters who have conducted thorough research into their character. The Humanities Council makes these characters available to both nonprofit and for-profit organizations across West Virginia. History Alive is designed as an interactive experience between the character and the audience. They are entertaining and educational. We encourage your organization, school, or event to host a presentation and bring a figure from history for a visit with your audience or students. Having someone like Harriet Tubman or Stonewall Jackson come to speak to your group can breathe life into these historical figures. Nothing compares to the live, in-person visit. Each presentation consists of three parts, a monologue, a question-answer period with the character, and then the presenter breaks character to answer questions about how he or she conducted their research. Our History Alive presenters have researched a variety of sources such as diaries, journals, letters, official documents, autobiographies, and the research of other scholars in developing their character. A History Alive presentation is not a play, it is an audience participation event that relies on interaction between the audience and the character. Being able to ask your own questions of these important figures from the past is a unique experience. It's difficult to reproduce the feel of an actual History Alive presentation here in the studio. Without an audience to ask questions, we will change the format a bit and have our guests sit with me for a few questions after the monologue. But we hope to give a sample of how a History Alive presentation can add to your program offerings. There will be information on the screen at the end of this program for how to contact the Humanities Council about bringing a History Alive character to your community. At this time, I would like to welcome today's guest from history. We are pleased to have with us in the studio, Abigail Adams. Miss Adorable, that's me. <laughs> I hereby order you to give me as many kisses and as many hours of your company after nine o'clock as I please to demand and charge them to my account. Who would write such a saucy letter to me, Abigail Adams? Why, none other than that staid and upright, remarkable husband of mine, John, John Adams. We started writing to each other when we were courting, and I loved writing to John. But I was so embarrassed by my lack of education and my poor spelling. I couldn't understand why my brother William could go to school and I could not. After all, don't men want to have some type of a interesting conversation from a, a well-educated woman that, who will be by their side their entire life? John and I agreed on this heartily. But at least I learned to read and I, I read everything I could find in my father's library and then my grandfather's as well. I would read and I would write. In fact, in one of the letters I wrote to John, I asked him to extol upon what my faults were. And among them, he said that, well, um, I crossed my legs when I sat. I said, what is a gentleman doing looking at a girl's legs? He said that I did not play cards well, that I did not sing well, and that I read too much. Well, I told him that was one thing I definitely was not going to change, reading. <laughs> I love to read. The first time John was away was when he was named as one of the delegates to the Continental Congresses. We wrote letters, of course, back and forth then. I wrote to him about what was happening at home. I was very proud that he was representing us. They had convened these congresses because over the course of about 10 years, Parliament was putting taxes on us, tax after tax on sugar, on papers with their stamps, on lead, all sorts of things, and of course, tea. I'm sure you've heard about that tea party they supposedly had in Boston Harbor when the Sons of Liberty dressed up like Mohawk Indians and they threw those cases of tea into the harbor. We had had enough and something had to be done. 
We had no voice, no say, but yet they wanted us to continually pay their taxes. When John left, at one time he left us in the, mad in the middle. When John left that one time, he left us in the middle of a war zone because the battles had begun there in Boston and we only lived a few miles away. It began on June the 17th, 1774, 3 a.m. I heard the cannons firing. We could neither eat nor sleep nor drink. We were under so much distress as the, the firing went on clear through the next day, Sabbath at three in the afternoon when I wrote to John and told him of what was happening. I had taken little Johnny, he was seven then, up to the top of Penn's Hill. From there we could look out over Boston Harbor and we saw the bombardment of the city. We saw fighting in the streets and then in Charlestown where my father was born, fire. Fire that burned that town to ashes as Johnny and I walked back down to our home. We didn't know what to say. We didn't say anything, but I know that it was so seared upon my memory that I would never forget that. John Quincy said as well. I wrote to John about what happened there that day, about the refugees that came to our house and the, the men that were fighting for us and I would give them food and lodging. I told him of the shortages of food that we were experiencing and of pins and other supplies. And he started sharing my letters with the others there, the delegates at the convention. And they lived far away. They had no idea what the war was like, what we were experiencing. They thought they could appease King George, that over time he would relent or compromise. But they soon began to see that that was not the case, that he meant to put us under his thumb. My husband, John, was the most outspoken and ardent person speaking for independence, that we needed to have our own country. I continued writing to John, and I knew that we would have to form new laws when this country was formed, and I wrote him another letter. I said, my dearest friend, and that is what we called each other, and by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, desire you will remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. As a woman, I cannot vote. I have no say in what happens. Everything that I brought into my marriage, if I earned a wage, even the children that I bore, they are all considered my husband's, not mine. So yes, I told him, remember the ladies, we are seeking freedom from a tyrant, from someone that we have no say in the laws they enact upon us. Can't these delegates see that the women also are under the thumb of their husbands and they also should have a voice. And then the slaves, they are seeking freedom. The delegates, 
shouldn't they also free their fellow man? John sent me a draft of the early declaration there in May. And I was very dismayed to find that nothing was mentioned in it about the ladies or about the slaves. On July 2nd, without a dissenting vote, a declaration was voted on. Over the course of the next two days, they amended it, they made some changes, and on July 4th, it was voted on and enacted as the Declaration of Independence from Great Britain. My husband, my John, did not sign it until August the 2nd. But when he signed his name to that paper, what he was doing was declaring that he was a traitor to the crown and his life could be forfeit. He could be hung as a traitor. When John finally returned home, he had been gone nearly two years. I continued writing to him. He was only home a very short time before he was named as the minister to France. And I had to bid him goodbye. He took our son, John Quincy, with him there as he crossed in winter on that dangerous crossing of the Atlantic Ocean, and I feared for their lives. My boy was only 10. It was months before I finally received word that they were safe. Mm. I sacrificed a lot for my country. Meanwhile, I am taking care of the farm. I am overseeing the workers. I barter so that we have enough food and supplies. But yet I have to sign my own husband's name to the contracts. I cannot sign them. I even started speculating in government securities so that we could have enough money to see us now into our old age. John returned from there, and in the brief time that he was home this time, he was asked to write the Constitution for the state of Massachusetts. John came up with this very clever idea of, of forming three branches of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judicial, and then having the legislative be bicameral, having a Senate and a House of Representatives. He then was recalled back to France. So I said goodbye to him one more time, and he was gone. <laughs> of the 20 years we had been married, half of our lives we had been separated at this point. <sighs> Eventually, he was named then as the ambassador to Great Britain because the war had come to an end. He urged me to come there with him, and I was afraid, but I did. I went to Great Britain and I, I listened for him in the, in the society and found out what was happening so I could advise him on diplomatic measures. I have always been his advisor. John has agreed with me and listened to me almost entirely everything that I've advised him to do. When we returned to the United States, we were greeted as heroes. <laughs> They had written the new constitution for the United States, and they based it on John's constitution for the state of Massachusetts. I was very proud of him. And his name was, was submitted there as president of the United States, and he received the second most votes, so he became vice president under George Washington, General Washington, such a remarkable man. My John was the vice president for two terms there in Philadelphia. He was elected then as the president of the United States. I was not able to join him for a while because I was taking care of his dying mother and I was not in good health either. 
John lost the election of 1800 to our former friend, Thomas Jefferson. That is all I would like to say about that. But he has returned to me now here to Peacefield on our farm where I hope that we will live out the remainder of our years in peace, as the name says. My John is finally home. I was reminiscing about that first time he left me across the ocean and one of the letters I wrote to him. Difficult as the days, cruel as the war has been, separated as I am on account of it from the dearest connection in life. Yeah. I would not exchange my country for the wealth of the Indies or be any other than an American. And though I have been called to sacrifice to my country, I can glory in my sacrifice and derive pleasure from my intimate connection with one who is esteemed worthy of the important trust devolved upon him. My dearest friend, my beloved, my John. As I mentioned at the beginning of the program, it's difficult to capture the exact feeling of a History Alive presentation. Nevertheless, we're very lucky today to be joined by the second First Lady of the United States, Abigail Adams. Thank you for joining us today, Mrs. Adams. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to ask you a few questions, of if that's course. all right. Um, I'd love to know what you feel your greatest contribution is uh, to the American War of Independence or, or the way it's remembered, perhaps, through the years. Ah, oh. sometimes I feel that my contribution was very small compared to John's. But um, I believe with sharing with him what was happening with the war on the home front and him sharing those letters then also with the delegates there at the Continental Congresses, that it made a great impact on them. It was uh, the, the proverbial uh, straw that broke the camel's back. It was made them realize just what we were facing. And also um, contributing to John in, in that I, I allowed him <laughs> to, to go and to serve our country while I stayed home and took care of the family and the children and I made that sacrifice on behalf of him. Writing to him also about what I thought he should do, giving him sound counsel and advice which he followed. In fact, when, when he was the president, I was referred to as Mrs. President because they said that I contributed too much to John. Hmm. Well, looking past uh, the war like you did, um, like you did just now, uh, as someone who has accomplished so much in the span of your life, um, what do you feel the greatest achievement is that you've made? Well, the greatest achievement Speaking my mind, showing that a woman does have thoughts in her head that are worth listening to. And I, I think that's very important that men realize that women do need to have formal education such as they did. That I um, am an example of, of how a woman can contribute by advising her husband in the ways that I did to make us a more stable and, and, and good country. Hmm. Can you briefly describe for me what it was like to be uh, the very first to occupy the White House? Well, we don't call it the White House. It was the executive mansion or the president's residence. And it, it was not complete when we moved in. And the very first thing that I saw was that it was being built mainly with slave labor, and that very much upset me. Slavery was, was rampant around the Capitol, and, and believe me, it was not a good, a good place to be. The streets 
were muddy, there were animals roaming around, there were no sidewalks. It was not a city like Boston or Philadelphia. In the executive mansion, the, uh, the plaster hadn't even dried on the walls. It was so new, and the, the fireplaces hadn't been vented correctly, and the, and the smoke would all come into the rooms, and I had nowhere to put my laundry, so I hung them up there inside <laughs> of the White House, the executive mansion. It was a lot different than it, it will be one day, I'm sure. Did you ever entertain in the White House? Yes, uh, in the I executive did. mansion, I apologize. Yes, I did, but not, not um, probably not as much. People didn't stay long, especially in the winter months, and I was only there for a short while with him. I had to leave. Uh, it was so cold <laughs> in the White House, so the parties were very short-lived when people did come. <laughs> um, well, we very much appreciate your time with us today, Mrs. Thank Adams, you. and I'm looking forward to speaking with Joanne Peterson. Uh, yes. Now, uh, uh, Joanne Peterson is a veteran of the History Alive program and has been with it for many years. Um, you've portrayed several characters uh, through the years with the mm -hmm. History Alive program. Uh, what is it that drew you to Abigail Adams? Well, there are a couple of things that drew me to Abigail. Um, my first years of college were at Eastern Nazarene College, which was in Quincy, Massachusetts. And of course, that is where Abigail and John lived um, after their, their married life. Uh, they lived in Braintree, but Braintree, part of it became Quincy. And they do say Quincy, not Quincy, <laughs> just to let you know. Uh, when I was talking to Mark, um, the gentleman who was in your seat before, he, I, I had, a, a, put in uh, applications, proposals for the unsinkable Molly Brown, Margaret Brown, and for Ambassador Shirley Temple Black a couple of different times, and neither of them were ever accepted for audition. And so I asked him um, what he thought would be something that the council would want to hear, something that they maybe lacked. And he said, we have nobody from the Revolutionary War period. So of course, Abigail immediately came to mind with my connection to her from my college days. Mm -hmm. Once you started exploring her life, was there anything in particular that you personally connected to? Well, I, I realized I didn't know very much about Abigail Adams and about how feisty she was, how outspoken she was. Uh, I always thought she was in John's shadow, but really she was respected in her own right for being such a contributor to the birth of the new nation, being a founding mother. Um, the fact that she believed that women should be able to uh, be fully educated like men were, that in spite of the situation of not having formal education, she read and educated herself to be able to converse with people like Ben Franklin. And, and uh, she greatly admired George Washington. She felt, in fact, that, that her husband hadn't extolled his virtues enough in his letters <laughs> to her. So when she met him, that was a big thrill for her. Hmm. Hmm. What were some of your most important sources for gaining these insights into her life and character? Well, we have remaining over 2,000 letters that John and Abigail exchanged to each other. And the reason that they did this was because John realized what an important time in history that they were living. And he asked her to write down, make a copy of every letter she sent to him, and he would do the same. Now, they didn't, weren't able to do that at times. But um, there were letters that were lost at sea, that were lost through the Postal Service, wherever. But yet we still have those copies. Like I said, we have over 2,000 of those letters. So of course, that is very important to know about them. I brought along some of the books that I found most valuable. One is uh, called Abigail Adam Witness to a Revolution by Natalie S. Bober. Another one, Abigail Adams by Woody Holton. And Joseph Ellis, who wrote a number of books, uh, First Family, Abigail and John Adams is another good one. If you want a chapter book for children, this one I thought was wonderful, Remember the Ladies by Jerry Chase Ferris. That seems to be her most famous letter about remembering the ladies. And then I got this one, and it's a wonderful children's book, 
leave it to Abigail. You know, everybody else was doing things that made them not stand out, but leave it to Abigail. She would stand out and, and contribute even when others thought women couldn't do that. It's a very, very good book for children. Hmm. Of course, online there's a lot of research that you can do through um, historical websites. The uh, Massachusetts Historical Society has a lot of those letters in their possession there. I visited Peacefield. I, I visited Weymouth where she was born. I went to uh, their first home where they lived there in what was formerly Braintree and saw the salt box house they lived in and then the house John was born in as well. So that, uh, and, and I also went to their graves there at the church in Quincy, so yeah. that was exciting for me. This was pre-COVID. <laughs> um, what do you think Abigail Adams can still teach us today as people and as American citizens? Oh, I think that the, the, that no matter what position you find yourself in, maybe you don't think that you have enough education, you don't feel you have enough maybe resources to contribute something that everybody can. Don't think so little of yourself, even if other people do, or that um, your words have an impact, and that we, when we see things that are not right, such as Abigail did about the, the way women were treated, that she didn't just sit home and, and knit, she spoke up about it. She let people know her thoughts, and she uh, made a difference. Yeah. Very useful lessons for us all. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us today, You're Joanne. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. If your organization is interested in hosting a History Alive presentation, you can find more details online at www.wvhumanities.org or call us at 304-346-8500. Thank you so much for being with us today.